Hi everyone, and welcome to the tutorial. Today, we'll take a closer look at creating realistic gunmetal material. Even though the term is quite broad, in most cases it refers to a dark, grainy, grey finish used on firearm parts. We're going to recreate anodized aluminum, one of the most widely used materials in modern weapons, and walk through the entire process in Substance Painter. Let's get started. So, let's quickly go through the viewport settings. Environment Map, Tomako Studio. You can set any other studio, even a black and white one. Environment Alignment, Camera. This way all areas will be evenly lit without dark spots. Very convenient for texturing. Next, all the parameters are standard. Temporal Anti-Aliasing, 32. You can set it higher for a slightly sharper result. Tone Mapping, Linear. And if you are texturing specifically for Unreal Engine or any other engine, and you have certain parameters that need to be set from the start, you can switch to ACES and adjust everything the way you need. Next, Texture Filtering set to 8. Specular Quality, 128. All these parameters are default. The model was textured in 2K. It's optimized for a game engine. The right side is fully symmetrical. The upper and lower rail are also symmetrical to the left one, meaning only the left rail is fully unique and it's duplicated to the top and bottom. But the teeth are placed in a random order. Some are flipped, some are rotated by 180 degrees. So it doesn't perfectly mirror itself. This way there is some variation. Let's now dive directly into how to create the material. I turn off all the layers and we'll go through each stage step by step. The very first thing you need to do is gather references and you should dedicate enough time to this. Don't rush. Don't just grab any random photos of the part you're texturing, but look specifically for images with interesting surface details that you can transfer into your material. For example, here we can see differences in gloss. There are differences in color. You can also notice some kind of green patina appearing here. Here we can see damage on the rail. More wear here and also gloss variations, stains and so on. You simply can't keep all of this in your head. Creating a realistic texture from memory is extremely difficult unless you have an insane level of visual experience with these references where you remember every detail how dirt accumulates, how scratches are distributed, and so on. Ideally, if you can find a real object, hold it in your hands and photograph it. That's the best option. For example, I found this in a local gun store. It's a brand new handguard, but even here we see imperfections, dust, small damages, variations in roughness. We can look at the markings. They're not perfectly clean. The edges are torn and uneven. We're going to copy all this, maybe add something of our own as well. Here, the variations are very visible, and it's a good idea to replicate them. And here is a very interesting detail I liked, the leftover tool marks from milling along with tiny pits and micro scratches. So, having references like these at hand makes it much easier to create a photorealistic texture. Material that we saw on the references called hard anodized aluminum. It is one of the most common material used in modern firearms. Its surface usually appears matte or semi-gloss, in a dark grey tone with a subtle grainy texture. Hard anodizing is formed through an electrochemical process that converts the outer layer of aluminum into a dense, extremely hard oxide. It's not paint or a coating placed on top. The metal surface itself is transformed. The final look, smooth or grainy, depends on how the aluminum was treated before anodizing. Polished aluminum results in a smoother finish, while sandblasted surfaces produce a more visible grain. During the process, the metal forms a microporous oxide layer which can be filled with a dye, giving the surface additional color. Because of that, anodized aluminum can also appear in various tones and sometimes has a soft metallic sheen, depending on the dye and sealing method. So let's move on to creating the material. We'll start with the base. I chose a dark gray with a slight blue tint. Make sure you don't set it to black. The specular, as for a non-metal, stays as it is by default in the fill layer. 
Next, we set the glossiness. Since we've already decided the material will be matte, we set it to 0.4. Now we need to add grain. I use a standard material, type finish in the search, and here we find matte finish powder coated. Drop it into the folder with the base material. Now we need to adjust the scale and intensity. I already have it configured, so I'll simply turn it on. Now I want to extract this grain information and use it for the glossiness and the diffuse. I place an anchor above the filter in the material. Then I add a fill layer and in its mask I add a fill layer using the anchor's information. Choose which channel will be used for the information. Then we need to tighten it with levels so that the grain becomes more contrasty. Now it can be used for both the glossiness and the diffuse. I add it just a little, not too strong, so that it's barely noticeable. Okay, we are finished with base material. Let's go next. The next thing I do is add decals and text. I prefer doing this with a single mask instead of using a bunch of layers because they become very hard to edit later if something goes wrong. If I need to fix anything, I simply open the Photoshop file, correct the decal, and hit save. When auto-update for resources is enabled, the save texture will be pulled in automatically. Auto-update is enabled here. You need to turn on these two checkboxes. As we saw in the references, the structure of the text isn't perfectly even. On top, I added a warp to recreate that unevenness. In the end, I'll add an anchor and use this texture in the next layer. I add a blur and tighten it with levels to make the text smaller. I change the color and this way we get a dark outline. We can see a yellow edge around the letters. I also push the text in using the height map to make it look a bit more interesting. I create decals right after the base material because above them I'll be adding gloss variations, dirt, dust and I want those to sit on top of the decals. Next, we add surface irregularities. These include various imperfections, machining marks, milling traces, polishing marks, and so on. Everything interesting that we noticed in the references. I add soft damage on the edges. Metal never looks so straight and even. I also add surface wear to this folder. As we've already established, this is a very wear-resistant coating so chips will appear as tiny small dots in areas where the part could have been hit. It's not necessary to push chips into the height map. In fact, most of the time you shouldn't. I only added a few deeper chips. And now we move on to the main stage of texturing. You know, we'll work on the weathering of our part. That means adding wear marks, dirt, scuffs, stains, and so on. The peculiarity of this material is that it's almost uniform in color, so there's nowhere to add significant color variation. That's why our main channel is glossiness. The better the glossiness is developed, the more realistic the overall texture looks. Even with a completely flat, diffuse, well-crafted gloss can make the model look photorealistic. So we already have a bit of weathering in the form of chips, and some roughness added to the milling marks layer. I suggest splitting the next part of the work into two stages. First, we create soft roughness variations just to break uniformity. Second, we add eye catchers, contrast details that make the texture visually appealing. First layer, light dust accumulated in the corners, made with the dirt generator, with a custom grunge called Grunge Dust Wide added. I removed excess with a brush where dust shouldn't appear. Next, another layer of light dust distributed more evenly, with the raised areas cleaned up places where the part would rub against other surfaces. Next, glossy smudges, a bit of gloss variation. This is a standard map from Substance Painter. On top of it, I added an AO generator and hand-painted areas where sharp transitions appeared between UV shells. I want to mention that working with a lot of symmetrical elements is quite inconvenient. It's much easier when you have a single continuous piece with minimal shells and symmetry, but optimization requirements for game engines often force us to duplicate elements symmetrically. Moving on. 
additional glossy stains that add nice variations to overall looking. I used Custom Mask from my library and remove it from corners using AO and Paint layer. In this layer, I added worn areas on the rail. Here's how I created this mask. We take a photo with damage, drop it into Photoshop, convert to black and white with levels increase contrast. So only the bright damage remains. Anything extra can be cleaned up with a brush. These are mechanical damages from attachments that are constantly mounted and removed. I made it slightly lighter than background on gloss ends and specular. Next, two layers with random soft variations. One more important point about glossiness. It not only changes the roughness of the surface, but also affects its perceived color. The glossier a surface is, the darker it appears, and vice versa. The more matte it is, the lighter it looks. So even with glossiness variations alone, we are already creating some color variation. But these are softer, more subtle changes. They work very well when we need the part to look visually clean, but not flat. After that, more scratches on the rails, but only on the glossiness map. I also added circular marks inside the holes. These holes are where QD mounts or sling attachments are inserted. And the last two layers in this folder are high contrast matte spots and high contrast glossy spots. They are small scale accents, but because they have strong contrast, they draw attention and act as eye catchers. They were hand painted using alphas made with the same method I showed earlier on the rail. The matte spots have a dark red color on the diffuse. Next, I add light glossy edges, again only in the glossiness map. Made very simply, a curvature generator with a blur on top. Then I cleaned the generator in areas where the part would experience less rubbing, and using subtract mode added grunge leaks to make the generator look a bit more natural. Then I add small white and dark yellow dust dots across the model, and clean them slightly around contact surfaces. Next layer, dried oil, matte in glossiness, and dark in color. Dust sticks to this oil. In the diffuse of this layer, I used a dirt texture. You can use any contrast texture with color variation. It could even be a photo of a wall, concrete, anything with contrasting yellowish variations. There's one layer I didn't show diffuse variations. They're quite subtle, essentially an AO generator with procedural textures blended on top using different blending modes. The goal of this layer is to add more depth and small color variations. And finally, I added sharpening on the gloss to make the texture crisper, and on top a layer that slightly bumped up the contrast using levels. That's it. I hope I was concise and didn't miss any important details. If anything is unclear, feel free to ask in the comments. I'll gladly reply. In the next videos, we'll take a look at other common materials. Thanks for watching.